it's you know i i I've, I've never heard anybody else read it you know i mean it's and i can't wait that is so challenging i don't know how you're doing it honestly like because i couldn't do it with my own book i don't know how writers but especially writers who are actors do that like give over that control baffles me Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us and uh, watching our show today. Um, I'm Victoria Gherkin. I'm the head of acquisitions at Podium Audio. We are an audio first publisher that specializes in bringing the best indie sci-fi and fantasy stories into the audio realm, including fan favorites like Expeditionary Force and Stalmonger and soon to be the Tinderbox Soldier of Indira, which is what we're here to discuss today. Uh, with that, let me introduce our esteemed guest. Uh, you'll recognize him from his many film and TV credits, but today it is our pleasure to introduce him as author. His novel, The Tinderbox, The Soldier of Indira, is releasing in October, Lou Diamond Phillips. Yay! So thrilled to be here. So thrilled to be here. I actually, I, you know, the, the glasses aren't a prop. I actually need them to see your beautiful faces. So uh, I'm not pretending to be an author. It's, it's not a method. Might be more beautiful without the glasses. Yeah. Uh, next up is one of the extraordinary performers who helped bring the story to life. She recently was inducted as a Golden Voice, Audiophile's highest honor and Lifetime Achievement Award. You don't look old enough for Lifetime Achievement <laughs> saying that. For her accomplished tenure as a narrator, Julia Whalen. Hello, hello. I'm so happy to be here. And last but not least, the man who changed the audiobook landscape with his performance of the Martian audiobook, for which he won an audio award, and is the voice of iconic characters like Skippy the Magnificent, R.C. Ray. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm muted. Um, Lou, um, I know you've written screenplays, but this is your first published novel, am I right? Uh, tell us how uh, the origins of the Tinderbox, how it came to be. Yes, it is. My father, who was, uh, uh, he's very much a redneck, grew up in North Carolina and now lives in Texas, uh, asked me what I wanted to do for a living. And, uh, you know, I, I said, uh, well, you know, I think I want to be a writer. And, you know, George said, well, you might want to, you know, think of something where you might make some more money. And <laughs> so, you know, I came back a couple of years later and said, I want to be an actor. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, not what he had in mind. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, you know, I, I ripped off a Stephen King type novel in high school. Uh, I wrote a my my version of a Richard Bach in college, and I actually might revisit that. But I got away from narrative writing. Uh, I started doing a lot more uh, theatrical work. Uh, I produced a couple of plays. Uh, I recently uh, had uh, one of my plays produced at the uh, Seven Angels Theater in, in Connecticut in Waterbury, uh, which was wonderful. Um, but I, I never really uh, uh, thought I'd get back to narrative writing. And uh, when my wife and I uh, first met and started getting to know one another, I discovered what an amazing illustrator she is. And she had done a, an entire series of uh, drawings that were actually anime. She was very much into anime. She, has, she used to have sort of two distinct styles. One was anime. The other was this sort of German woodcut almost a throwback to the original Hans Christian Andersen type type uh, illustrations or the Tennille illustrations from Alice in Wonderland. She'd had a whole series of uh, drawings that I think she intended to be a graphic novel at some point, inspired by the Hans Christian Andersen short story, fairy tale, uh, The Tinderbox. And it just got me going and, 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 I, and I stole the idea. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and the original idea was to write a screenplay, uh, which is what I you know, do more often than not. Um, and I did. So I wrote the screenplay. But after I wrote the screenplay, I realized that it was far too expensive for someone to let me direct. <laughs> that it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, I've directed a lot, but I haven't directed anything of that size or scope. Uh, and, and so it was my manager, J.B. Roberts, who said, well, you know, you were going to write a novel about it one day anyway. Why don't you write the novel first, get that going, and then, you know, back into it and reverse engineer the screenplay from there. And that's how it started. Uh, and, and so uh, what's interesting and, and what's uh, 
sad for my wife is that she's not necessarily a sci-fi artist. She doesn't do sci-fi things. She, you know, she uh, she prefers fairy tales. She prefers mm -hmm. you know, the, the, that that sort of thing. Uh, and and I had originally chosen to set it in outer space because I thought it would make a more uh, marketable movie. <laughs> you know, <laughs> at the time, Avatar had happened and Star Wars was getting a resurgence. Uh, so you know with the idea of a film and she's a she's a geek she's a nerd you know she's like yeah yeah let's do let's do a big side my thing so i did but then she realized she had to illustrate it so she was really really mad at me uh, <laughs> but that's how that's how this version of the tinderbox came to be so that is yeah, the that, that's her cover design yeah well, thank you what's amazing though is that is that uh the original anime illustrations are not these these are what uh, she took from from the new narrative uh, uh, novel. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, but as you can see, I mean, even though it's not her bailiwick, man, she just killed it. She just did some stuff that you know she doesn't do battle scenes, she doesn't do you know hardware, she doesn't do technology. But man, I you know she she really thought outside the box. Uh, she often referred to uh, a wonderful quote by you know David Bowie. You know, he, he, he said in an interview, you know, you got to get out of your depth, man. You can't feel your toes on the on the bottom. You kind of mm -hmm. have to you know, let the current take you. And and she did. And, uh, you know, as a result, man, she she just came up with stuff that I think surprised even her. Very cool. So those are going to be in the book book edition. Obviously, exactly. we don't have uh, it's in the audio book, but we have voices that make pictures. Right, we can't really describe the pictures. That's not. Come on, that's not part of your progress. <laughs> not that's helpful. Not part of the deal. Um, but Julia, you have you've written a novel, and so I don't know if you want to dive in at all and talk about your. You, I noticed it's been optioned. Is it in development? It is in development. Film? Yeah. So it's a, um, but it's a very similar story. It's really funny to hear you talking about the same thing. I, 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 but reverse, I always wanted to be an actor and my parents were like, great, but can you maybe think of something else? And I was like, yes, writer. They were like, no. <laughs> um, but I, I had, uh, you know, I grew up and I've been a professional actor since I was nine. And um, I, that's really the lens through which I see story pun very much intended, I guess, um, where I think in character and I think in dialogue and I think visually. Um, but at the same time, I've always been a book nerd. And I, when I went to school, I was an English and creative writing major and came out of a very kind of literary institution. And, and so um, it's been something I've always done, but I, I was, same thing, I was working in screenplay mostly. Um, and when this uh, came up, I, I was like, I want to I, this is a story that's worth that's worthy of a book, and it is and called so that's my it year. And Oxford. it's called it's called my Oxford year. Oh, my Oxford year. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I like yours. <laughs> um, Does yeah. a comma happen anywhere in there? I'm just wondering. Sorry. Does a comma happen anywhere in there? Oh, there's okay. lots of commas. Yeah. No, yeah. There, of course. There's plenty of Oxford commas. That was like a, an entire editorial you know, t stab at it was, we just got to make sure all the Oxford commas are in the right place. <laughs> and you don't need those reviews. Because that would be embarrassing. Really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was, I, in preparing for talking to you today, I was, uh, you know, looking back at the, um, just the history of this fairy tale. And um, it's interesting, it was interesting to me that, of course, it comes from an oral storytelling tradition. And um, at the time that it was published, you know, in the early 19th century, Hans Christian Andersen was criticized for the simple language he used in retelling the story. Apparently, critics judged it to be too colloquial, um, which, of course, was the point. You wanted to tell the story aloud uh, to families and children. Um, and I think it's why his stories still resonate today and how they have you know, taken on a new life in Disney and now, you know, with, with your retelling, Lou, it's just, um, just amazing. And I thought what we should do for the people watching today is is have a little bit of it read by our um, our audiobook narrators. So, Julia, I think you've, you've picked a, a spot to read and then okay, yes. and above. In the colloquial, right? Okay. Please make it colloquial. Yes, okay. <clears throat> Chapter two. The surface of the ocean of Monterain was calm and unruffled, giving no clue to the turbulent undercurrents found in its depths. 
much like the azure eyes that gazed upon the water now. Princess Allegra stood at the rail of her lofty balcony overlooking the ocean, staring without really seeing. Those chosen few allowed to encounter the princess were always unsettled by the unflinching, faraway focus of her eyes. It was as if she were looking through them to a better place beyond. Allegra had been a prisoner in her own palace for the entirety of her 17 years. The person most disturbed by her countenance was her captor, her very own father, King Xander the Firm. Sadly, it was not guilt that caused his disquiet, Allegra knew. It was not knowing, not knowing his own daughter's mind, not being able to read her thoughts. It must be a characteristic of kings, Allegra decided, the need to know all. The proof of his paranoia was obvious and unavoidable, what with the constant presence of guards and the many surveillance cameras in every room. Upon puberty, Allegra had been forced to beg for a pittance of privacy, pleading with her parents to remove the cameras from her bedchamber. It was the only battle Allegra ever remembered winning, and even then, only with the intervention of her mother, Queen Noor. No, her father had not been christened King Xander the Firm by happenstance. And so Princess Allegra took not so secret satisfaction in her father's discomfort whenever he was in her presence. She knew with bitter clarity that the only privilege she possessed was the privacy of her thoughts, and hence the power to project herself beyond these palace walls. So lost was Allegra in her ocean of discontent that she failed to sense the presence behind her until she heard an urgent whisper in her ear. Princess Allegra, King Xander has summoned the four tellers. The princess calmly turned toward Geneva, her handmaid and also her best friend. Allegra's eyebrow arched upward with insouciant disinterest. Why should I care? They might change their minds. There might be something new. Her parents had given Geneva to her when Allegra had become a teenager to ease the solitude of her confinement. They had chosen her carefully, an orphan who would view life in the palace not as imprisonment, but providence. It was a wise decision, born of kindness and, once again, Queen Noor's idea. Geneva was a balm to Allegra's melancholy. Even so, Allegra knew that her friend saw the world within the palace as a place of bounty and boundless luxury only because she had seen the worst of the real world. Gratitude could only come from comparison, and that was a luxury Allegra herself had been denied. Still, she remembered with tenderness and more than a little guilt of privilege that it had been several days before Allegra had realized that Geneva had assumed she could only eat what Allegra had left behind. Geneva, I adore your optimism, Allegra said, but I'm afraid I'm destined to remain a prisoner until the day my father or I become inflamed. Geneva seemed near tears at the thought. Don't speak so, Allegra. The princess softened. Come then, let's see if we can take a listen anyway. And scene. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! You like that, that Liv? <laughs> uh, uh, it's you know I, I I I've never heard anybody else read it. You know I mean it's and I can't wait. That is so challenging. Talk. I don't know how you're doing it honestly, like because I couldn't do it with my own book. I don't know how writers, but especially writers who are actors, do that. Like give over that control baffles me. Oh, well, you know, that's, well, if you don't mind, uh, I'll, I'll uh, address that a little. I mean, I did read, I did read the entire thing from start to finish to Yvonne so that, that okay. she could concentrate on what came to her visually. And that, and that was part of our process for her illustrating the book, which I, I, to this day have loved. Uh, yeah. But I mean, we do that a lot. I read every prodigal son script to her too, and we get a kick out of that. Uh, but Early on, I mean, because I've done audiobooks as well, and the, the, the question was, well, are you going to narrate your own book? And um, J.B. Roberts, who's proved to be just such a wonderful, you know, sounding board and touchstone throughout throughout uh, my entire career, um, you know, he he uh, uh, he and, and then Red Bruno over at Aphon Books, you know, they thought it would be interesting to to um, hand it over, and in, in a way allow that interpretive process 
to to uh, uh, to blossom and 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 to, to to add other voices. And the fact that we got you two blows my mind because <laughs> it it gives to me, it gives it gives the book and the audio book much more street cred. Uh, I, I think a lot of people, critics, and even some have said this after, thank goodness, giving me a good review. You know, I've said they assumed that this was a vanity project, that, that I was doing this uh, and that and that it wasn't legit. And and I knew that, yeah. you know, I, I, I need to let go of this so it doesn't look like I'm just, you know, trying to create my own little cottage industry. Um, not to mention the fact that, I mean, we all, as we all know, you know, film, television, theater, all of it, it's 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 very much a collaborative process. So we're, it's something we're used to in direct films or directing television I want to hear other people's voices I want their best ideas like I can steal them like I stole my wife's you know <laughs> so so the idea that, that two people as as absolutely talented and and blessed as, as you are would be interested in reading this was uh, just fascinating to me just fascinating oh. so it, it really it, it's it's not been to let it go and go wow i can't wait to hear what you guys do all right well, with that oh. can i say something real quick you can i was, I was kind of no kind of, uh, no okay <laughs> go back in your box Bob. What I was, <laughs> I'm in my box. um what i was telling you before lou is that i, I probably like most of us that we've been watching you for years and loved you as an actor but when i heard you were coming out with a book i was like all right well, this, this could be good i like lou but and, and I, I told Rhett and I told uh, Emily over at Podium and I told Julia, I said, this is not just a, you know, a good book to read. It's fun as hell to narrate. Um, yes. It's really, really well written. And I'm not just, you know, kissing butt because you're sitting right there, but it's really fun. And the thing I got to tell you, I got about <laughs> halfway through and I don't know what the line was, but I was like, Oh yeah, he wrote this for you know a younger crowd, but I'm reading it. It's appealing to me, and I'm mid forties, and I'm I'm just thinking, man, this is a good book. It doesn't I, I don't think it just appeals to the you know the the younger crowd. It's it's a mm -hmm. good damn book. Excuse me. <laughs> but now, thank you. So well, I'm not the one who called it YA. Somebody said, well, this is YA. I went, oh, is it? Okay, fine. You know, I can't even spell YA. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's it's. Like, like the sports material, you know, I, I, I go back, you know, Hans Christian Anderson was not necessarily meant for children. Some of his stuff is really dark and, and it really, you know, uh, um, it's supposed to resonate in somebody who can think. Uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, great for kids, but there's a there's a layer there. There's a level there that, you know, is is uh, is even beyond that. And, and that's what this aspires to do. Uh, and it also aspires to not be, you know, pigeonholed. Uh, yes, it's sci-fi. Yes, it's fantasy. Yes, it's YA. But it, but it also tries to be something, you know, more uh, all-encompassing than that. And that, you know, that you can enjoy it. And, and my 12-year-old daughter could enjoy it as well, you know. So, so uh, but, but for different reasons and on different levels. Right. Yeah, well, I was going to say it kind of transcends levels. It's... It is a good book. There's no question. Right. It's a great story. Period. Yeah. It's so well written. Um, I was saying about the alliteration in there. Things will just happen. I'm like, oh, that was fun. Especially when I don't mess up. <laughs> it's like that ski <laughs> that ski run where you're like, woo, got it, done. Uh, but yeah, from uh, from a narrator's point of view, it's it's a blast to do. So yeah. I so read a little, Bob. Read a yes. little for us. Read to us. Entertain us. Dance. Oh me. Oh, yes. I gotta go after Julia now. Yeah, I can't do that. She's all serious looking and 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 I'm not ready. <laughs> all right, we're doing get backwards. Bob out of his trailer. Yeah, all right, we're going backwards now. Okay, chapter one the cracked quilt of the desert floor stretched before the soldier like a puzzle with no end, reminding him of the mosaic pattern tiles in a palace from his childhood. Everson couldn't help but note with more than a little self-pity, that his childhood was now a world away, both physically and metaphorically. His own planet, Indira, was lush and green, yet another luxury he would never take for granted again. He trudged forward on the barren rock that was the planet Mono, home of the enemy he had come to kill. The twin sons of Femera and Amelie beat down on him unmercifully, without the considerate benefit of a single cloud. 
The heat intensified the throbbing pain in his head, as if his temples were pumping boiling blood through the veins in his cranium. He hadn't seen it coming, but he suspected that the errant hoof of a flyby burden had struck him solidly in the head, sending him into blackness. As a silver lining, and in spite of the monstrous headache he now endured, he was sure that being rendered unconscious had probably saved his life. At the moment of impact, he had, after all, been involved in mortal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Everson turned and looked back toward the Grand Schism, where the Endurance, his people, had landed to begin, in his mind, their unwarranted invasion. There was only the singular line of his footsteps, a reminder of the many missteps he had taken in his young life to bring him here, the middle of nowhere. He had no idea where he was going, and perhaps it was high time to formulate a plan. He half hoped to be discovered and saved from the brutal heat, However, the other half dreaded the treatment he would receive. He would certainly be recognized as an enemy soldier, with his swarthy skin and full battle gear. That is, if he wasn't simply killed on sight. This thought irritated him more than frightened him, especially since he hadn't willingly chosen this path for himself, the path of a soldier. No, that was someone else's idea. And so, resentment fueled Everson's feet methodically toward a dubious future, where even death would be a vindication. Not that it would change anything about his current predicament, but it gave Everson a smidgen of satisfaction to think that he had been right, that the battle should never have happened. Is that all right? Is that good? Done? Oh. Oh, thank you. I thought that was great. That was really great. So you, um, Lou, I don't know if you know this, but um, Bob and Julia have uh, collaborated on other projects together. Um, I think most recently Solitude, right? Dean Cole's series where you play the lost man and woman after a cataclysmic event. Um, I don't know, it might be fun for you guys just to talk a little bit about how the two of you get your yin and yang going. Like, how do you? Sure. Do so, you uh, the end? Yeah. <laughs> assign us one, please, and then we'll go from there. Um, no, I mean, actually, Bob brought me into uh, solitude, um, and I don't, I don't know how that happened. I don't know um, why me. I mean, I was known for kind of doing like domestic thrillers and YA before that, and he was like, "Give her sci-fi. She'll be fine." <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. That's it. You yeah. did our Sarah Lyons Fleming series. Well, no, you did that. Uh, that is true. Yes, that is true. Did a little what bit of post apocalyptic. Ah. Our, um, now called the um, conference well, series. Dean, Dean came to me and said he wanted to, you know, he wanted to split it into two voices, what I thought. And then I don't know what it was. I think I had just heard you do something. Um, I don't know, maybe was at the Audis or something. But I was like, I think she'd be really good. And I even told you this. I was like, I, I kind of want to see my name next to hers on the cover <laughs> of, a, of a book. I think that'd be awesome. Because she's all right. I mean, she's, she's a pretty good narrator. So, you know, I think <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. But, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, I just, you no, know, I, I, I want to say great for what's that? No, and I was just going to say, uh, when when Red Bruno over at Athon uh, uh, mentioned the idea to me to have you know a, a male and, and a female uh, uh, narrator, I thought, wow, how cool is that? Because it's not it's 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 not uh, as if it, it were a radio play or something, and I've done those as well. But I mean, a lot of the book is 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 it switches point of view. It's not all just. Right. Everson, the young hero, as as you know, the, this chapter two starts with you know Princess Allegra, mm -hmm. and and throughout the book we shift perspective from male to female uh, as as we in introduce other characters, and and to have you know a a, uh, a gender specific voice you know to those perspectives I think is is absolutely brilliant. Not to mention it, you know, I mean it it, it just it provides more equitable opportunity of employment, which is something we're all fighting for, I hope, these Thank days. Exactly. And, and the <laughs> fact that the novel could could um, uh, provide that uh, and, and provide that voice. I mean, I'm, I'm the father of four daughters, you know? Uh, uh, and that was also one of the challenges of telling a fairy tale 
was to take that, you know, idea of that, that, that uh, construct that, you know, is so familiar to all of us and to turn it on its feminist ear a little bit. And to right. get How do you that other the... So yes, Allegra, right. Allegra, exactly. Without to be, and I'll, you know, all due respect, you know, without getting too Disney-fied about it, you know, I mean, right. I, I, it's that, that, that gets a little simplistic at times, you know, so, but to, to have the point of view, not only from Allegra, but from her mother, the queen, from the witch, who I think is an amazing character, uh, and I think maybe Yvonne's favorite, you know, um, it, it, it all, it, it all, I, I think, contributes to telling a very well-rounded and hopefully uh, a relevant story to contemporary readers. Yeah. Agreed. 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 And, and yeah, listeners. we, I mean, yeah. yeah, and we, you know, that's part of the, in terms of building out that whole cast of characters, you know, going back to the collaboration question, it, what's nice is Bob and I have worked together now for years and we kind of have a shorthand where I'm able to say something like we shared, you know, character files back and forth with each other so we could hear what the other person was doing. But I can also say, I'm going to do Allegra mostly in my tone, maybe a little softer, you know, princessy. And he's like, got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I'm ready to go. I have it yeah, right, in, yeah. right at the surface. <laughs> and I've got Bob's general voice down, you know. There you go. Yeah, no, I know. I, oh, I did that really, really gruff. <laughs> did, did, you, did you set each other traps at all? Do you have fun with each oh, other that way? No, I, I wouldn't. We won't play with other people's time that way. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they deserve it, and then... <laughs> But no, definitely not with this. Although I was after I did that voice, I was like, "Oh, that's that's rough." But you, you, you the other it's one a suggestion. It, I'm it's never going to be able to fool anyone that I'm yeah. RC Bray. But it's just a suggestion. <laughs> this is true. This yeah. Is true. As long as you sound very bitter and grouchy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> grouchy with a bit of New England in there. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> well, this was. A lovely conversation. Um, That's it. I... <laughs> <laughs> you got three actors here. We'll talk forever. I was waiting for uh, Kyle to give me direction on um, on what we're. Lou, you. Is Kyle? Can right? I can I make a point, and you guys can edit this however you want? But one yeah. thing that occurred to me, as we were talking about the transition from acting to writing. Um, one thing that I feel is very intact with this book, and I've found to be generally true of actors who write, is um, the voice is very strong and authoritative. And it's because when you are creating the voice of a book, of a text, you're creating a character. Even if it's not a character on the page, it is a character that is taking the reader or listener through the story. And so you can tell, I think in this book, Lou has a very good sense of who the character is of the voice of the book. Hmm. And that's where I think, Bob, to your point, just how strong and how fun it is, is you just feel like you're in very capable hands because the voice of the book is a fully rendered character. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. That's really nice, probably because I'm not a writer, but I think you just nailed it, though. Yeah, it kinda, I said I was saying everything drops away and you're just reading and you're enjoying you know, sometimes you read ones that you got to work to get through, but there, this was just, I enjoyed every minute of it. It's just because it's intact. It's, it's intact. Yeah. Fully. Yeah. It's holistic. Yeah. Right. So, and anyway, for what that's you know, I'm so, um, I, I, I'm so gratified, I'm so touched to hear this. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, interesting to your point, Julia, it's, it's almost as if, you know, I mean, when you play a character, you know, when we all play characters, whether it's a voice character, whether it's, you know, a character, you know, in on stage, or uh, you know, on film, uh, you know, you accept the worldview of that character. You you don't apologize for them. You don't hold them at arm's length. You embrace them and you try to speak through them. You are the vessel. You are the conduit uh, that, that that story is being told. And uh, for this, obviously, there is a, a very... Um, definite touchstone, which is Hans Christian Andersen and that style. But um, the um, the other touchstones were, you know, like Lewis Carroll, who's a huge favorite. I mean, my production company with my wife is called Fragis Day, you know, 
and Jabberwocky. And, uh, and, and some of that wordplay, some of that whimsy uh, is, is definitely, you know, at the doorstep of, of uh, uh, Lewis Carroll or Oscar Wilde or, you know, and, and some of the, uh, the observation, you know, tries to be more, a little more Jonathan Swift. So it is not completely contemporary. Uh, and, you know, some people go, well, the language is a little heightened. It's like, yes, I, I, I sometimes chose archaic words. I sometimes chose you know, uh, uh, rhythms more more given to to Shakespeare or to you know a, a conversation that, that that felt more, you know, it, it, it wasn't one you're going to have at the mall. Let's put it that way, you know. And and so that it, it was keeping myself in that character of that storyteller. I think that gives it, you know, its its ultimate character. And uh, not all of my writing is like this. This is this is very specific to this particular piece. Right, you developed a character through which to tell this story. Exactly. I mean, I'm telling you what you did, but. <laughs> and I appreciate that because, you know, men need to be more playing to sometimes too. It's very important. You just won't get it otherwise. Yes, yes. Again, for what it's worth, man, I, if I were you, I'd be proud of myself to no, to no limit. I, it, I, I can't say enough. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm excited to get the final files over to you, Lou. Like I said, I, that just, you know, that gives it. Well, it was our pleasure. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. I'm, I'm yes. really excited. I'm really excited to hear because that, that man, that little amuse bouche from both of you <laughs> was just, oh, you know, just <laughs> wonderful, man. And cheers. I love it. Which I think should be and, our narrator uh, name. So Bob. exciting. Like, I, I feel like we should have like yeah we should have like a band that's just like our, when we narrate like a co-narration name and it should be a muse bouche. Uh, oh <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah. Braylon. Or... That's it. Yeah, Braylon. <laughs> Done. Oh, I can see the logo now. It's coming. Yeah. 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 Well, Lou, you won't have to wait too long to hear it because I know these lovely people have wrapped up recording. But uh, everybody else will be able to listen on October 20th, which is mm. when it releases and uh, in yeah. audio and in book book, because, you know, it's an audio book and it's a book book. Yeah. Book book has the lovely pictures in it um, and the fabulous cover. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, they're all, everything is on pre order on Amazon and Audible, um, or if you get your books. And yeah, we'll be seeing. Lou on the TV, and we'll be seeing Julia and Bob. Yeah. What's that, Lou? I was going to say I should point out that uh, the hardcover book will uh, have the complete uh, collection of Yvonne's illustrations, whereas the ebook uh, will have select uh, uh, drawings. It will not have all of them. So if you want to get all of them, then I highly recommend that you do. Uh, then you're going to want to hold it in your hands and get the hardcover book. That's right. And you could get the you could get the ebook for convenience and then the audiobook for when you're walking. You could go you for get, the triple. You get two print books and you then go for the triple. One you keep intact, the other you rip out the artwork and frame it. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Always thinking. I yeah, yeah. Always thinking. <laughs> All right, well thanks for joining us. And thank you. Thank you. See you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.